Uh, well, we're glad you guys are here this morning. I'm uh, pretty, I'm glad to see a few folks joining us online, and uh, we're glad you guys are here with us. I know some of y'all are in quarantine, some are on vacation, and uh, some are out uh, on the road working and things like that, but we're glad that you all are here with us, uh, however you can be, to worship Jesus with us. And We've been preaching through the Gospel of Mark in a series called Serving like Jesus, and uh, today we're going to be in chapter 4, and uh, the message today is called the Kingdom of God, and uh, last week we introduced a parable to you, and today we're going to be looking at uh, a few other parables, but uh, as we read the text today, you will notice that Jesus refers to the Kingdom of God several times, and uh, uh, it was a popular message that Jesus preached. He preached the kingdom of God, or the synonymous phrase, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or it's the kingdom of God is near, and things like that. And, and so you might be uh, wondering, well, what in the world does he mean, the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven is near? And, and I, I believe the simplest way for us to really understand what the kingdom of God is, is that the kingdom of God is the place where God rules and reigns. It's really that simple. And uh, you think, well, God, he, he rules and reigns over the entire universe, right? And uh, obviously he does. He's our creator, and he, he is in complete control. He's the sovereign ruler of everything. Uh, but specifically, when we, when we see Jesus preaching the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is near, I, I think there's a specific application that we need to understand, and, and that is uh, it, it's a personal reign over our hearts and our lives and I think that that's what we need what we need to understand you see Jesus preached that the kingdom of God is coming and I want you to understand that the kingdom of God comes to every person who believes on Jesus for salvation and willingly submits to him uh, as Lord and, and today we're going to see we're going to look at three different parables and uh, as we look into these parables uh, I, uh, I hope that we can see a little bit of insight into the kingdom of God and what, and some of the things that Jesus is trying to help us understand about the kingdom of God. So read with me, uh, beginning in verse 21 of Mark chapter 4. and I'm going to read down through verse 34 this morning. And Jesus also, he said to them, Is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? There's nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything <clears throat> been kept secret, but that it should come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Then he said to them, Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Then we come to the second parable. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day and the seed should sprout and grow. And he himself doesn't know how, but the earth yields crops by itself. First the blade, then the head, and after that, the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts, it, puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And then he said, this is the third parable, he says, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we picture it? It's like a mustard seed, which when it is sown on the ground, it's smaller than all the seeds on earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs, and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. It says, And with many such parables he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable he did not speak to them. And when they were alone he explained all things to his disciples. This is the word of God. Let's pray together. Father, we do just to bow before you this morning. And Lord, we're grateful for your word, the word of truth. Lord, we understand these stories, and Lord, uh, you, the point that you're making, and Lord, what you're trying to help us to understand about the kingdom of God, give us revelation in that, God, help us to see your truth, and 
Lord, let it penetrate our hearts and our lives. And Lord, we pray that today that you do your work in each of us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. A few years ago, I traveled to Phoenix, Arizona for the Southern Baptist Convention and a few other pastors and I decided to take an afternoon and uh, to drive up to the to see the Grand Canyon. Um, you know, the, a few friends of mine, we just got to discussing it and if I re recall correctly, it's about a three-hour drive. I think it's a little less than that from Phoenix, but uh, depending on who's driving, I guess, <laughs> in traffic. But, but, you know, we were all from Tennessee and North Carolina and and so we decided to take advantage of our proximity since we didn't know if we'd ever venture out that way again. And, and uh, we decided since we were that close, we just needed to make it happen. So uh, we, we picked an afternoon when a lot of things were going on that we weren't that interested in and we just took off, you know. And it was about lunchtime, I think. And, and uh, we, I think it was the southern rim we drove to up there. And just a beautiful drive. We, we, we enjoyed our time together. Uh, you know, and we got out and, and in the parking lot, and we walked out to the rim, and and we just admired the beauty of of the Grand Canyon, and and um, it was enjoyable. I've got a couple of uh, proofs, pictures that I was there. Are they, are they there's one? See there, uh, that was back when I had some hair, not much, but a little bit, and uh, probably at least forty pounds lighter, maybe I don't know, but but uh, and then uh, there's another one, obviously where I slipped off, and you know I was trying to. <laughs> Trying to trying to climb back up, uh, but uh, but 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 anyway, uh, it, it's just a beautiful sight. Um, it was worth the trip, and um, but in order for us to make that trip work, you know, we had to kind of plan. We had to figure out when we were going to leave, what time we'd get back, plan the route, who's paying for the gas, who's driving, all those things uh, to make it happen. It's definitely worth it. Uh, you know, we had a good time, and. Um, uh, actually, I wound up doing that twice but because <laughs> uh, uh, I went back again and some of the other guys hadn't been. So I was like, hey, I've been. I'll take it, you know. Uh, so, uh, but, but the first time it was really awesome. The second time it was still awesome but not quite as much. But, uh, but, <laughs> but anyway, but what I want you to realize something this morning is I want you to realize that, that just like the, the Grand Canyon was somewhat near to me, I want you to understand today that the kingdom of God is near to you. The kingdom of God is near and the question today is, will you take the action that you need to take to enter into the kingdom of God? Will you do what it takes to experience the kingdom of God? And I, I want to share three actions with you this morning that can help usher the kingdom of God in. Not just for you, but for others. Because I think this is a lot of what it's about. But, but uh, I want us to understand those things today. Three actions that can help usher in the kingdom of God. The first one is this. I want you to understand today the importance of letting Christ be seen in your life. Let Christ be seen in your life. If you're a Christian, people should be able to see and tell that you're a Christian, that you belong to Christ. This is what this is kind of about. But notice the question. Jesus started out... Um, this parable in verse 21, uh, uh, this story about a lamp. And verse 21 can literally be translated like this. The lamp comes in not to be put under a bed or a basket. And so the lamp is the one doing the action. The lamp comes, which is a little bit unusual. The lamps don't come. But <laughs> Maybe Jesus did that on purpose because I think it's important for you today to understand that Jesus is the lamp here in this parable. Jesus is the light in this parable. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons maybe he worded it this way. Uh, notice Jesus' own words from the Gospel of John. I want to share a couple different passages from John's Gospel with you. But notice what Jesus says in John chapter 8. He spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness but have the light of life. Jesus is the light. Amen. He's, he's the light here. He's the lamp. He's the one that sheds light on the whole world. He, he reveals everything. Nothing can, be, nothing can be hidden from him. And remember in the first part of John, in the first uh, chapter of John's gospel, uh, John writes, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it or could not overtake it or could not understand it. And then he talks about John the Baptist. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. 
This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light. That all through him might believe he was not that light. John the Baptist was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of the light. And so hopefully you can see that Jesus is the light here. If you want to understand this parable, you have to understand Jesus is the lamp in this parable. He is the light that shines into a dark, sinful world. Jesus made the point, nobody brings a light into a room to hide it. And of course back then they didn't have electric lights or electronic lights. and They they lit lamps and candles and they brought them in and they, they would set them in the middle of the room so it shined all over the room. Today we got lights everywhere. But, but uh, you bring a, a, a light into a dark room to reveal the content so you can see what's there to make the room maneuverable and usable because in the darkness uh, it, it, sometimes it's dangerous, isn't it? And in the same way, I want you to understand Jesus, and this is, this is what the point Jesus is trying to make. Jesus came into a dark world to reveal truth, to conquer darkness and evil. That's the lamp of God. That's the light of the world. That's Jesus. When we look at verse 22, we see that he, he says that some things are currently hidden. He says for Nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor is anything being kept secret, but that it should come to light. And so, you know, he, he's saying there's some things that you can't see. There's obviously some things that are hidden, but eventually everything's going to come to light. Because the light of Jesus shines into every dark corner. And it will all be seen. And, and, and so uh, the world and all its evils may try to hide in the corners but nothing will escape the revealing truth of the light of King Jesus. The following verses are an appeal by Jesus. He says, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And so it's an appeal by Jesus again to listen carefully and to use the opportunities that God gives you to believe, to hear the truth and to believe the truth and to share the truth because you'll be judged based on what you do with what you've been given. And so look what he says. He says, take heed what you hear. And with the same measure you use to hear, that's what you'll get. That's how, that's how you'll receive it. If you're listening with a big old cup, you're going to hear a big old cup's worth. But if you're listening with a thimble's worth, you're going to get a thimble's worth. Does that make sense? <laughs> and he says, you know, the more you hear, the more you're given. And he says... To whom who, for whoever has, to him more will be given. But who does not have, if you're not listening, if you don't take heed, if you don't pay attention, if you're not listening for truth, eventually what you do know, you won't even remember it. It'll be taken away. That's what he's getting at. And so he's saying, look, the, the light is coming to the world. The following, uh, you know, uh, 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 verse 25 basically means if, if you receive the truth revealed by the light of Jesus, you can expect more. But if you reject it, well, I'll be taken away. And I want you to understand the light of the Lord Jesus Christ shines in the world to reveal truth. And if you're one of his, if you're a Christian, the light of Christ shines through you. The light of Christ should shine through you. <laughs> you know, in 1895, a German physicist named Wilhelm Röntgen, that's German, right? I don't know how well I did the pronunciation, but if you look at how it's spelled, that's probably the best you can do too. But anyway, he discovered the X-ray technology that we use today by accident. He, uh, he was experimenting with electron beams in a gas discharge tube, and his tube, he surrounded it by heavy black cardboard because, you know, that keeps the radiation away. At least that's what he thought. But, but anyway, he, he placed several objects between the tube and the screen, but he noticed the screen always glowed. And so finally he put his hand in front of the tube, and when he did, he saw the silhouette of all the bones in his hand on the screen. Can you imagine that? I mean, I, I don't know what was going through his mind. He's like, oh, you know, I don't know. It, it probably was a little bit scary, but, but um, obviously this was a, a breakthrough, a, a revolutionary discovery for medical science. And we still use x-rays almost exactly the same way today. And, you know, and, and, and what x-rays are, are basically x-rays are visible light rays. And so it's just light. 
And, and these light rays shine through your body. And most of us in here probably had x-rays, and you understand exactly what I'm talking about. And they real, reveal a lot of things that normally you can't see. Well, I want you to understand this. I want you to understand in a similar way, the light of Jesus shines right through you. And your life can reveal the truth of who Jesus is to people who otherwise, otherwise might not understand that their hearts are, are broken. Their souls need mending and, and they, they need the blood of Jesus uh, as a cure. And that's what the light of Jesus can do through your life. You know, Jesus said as much in, in the Sermon on the Mount in, in Matthew chapter 5, he said, you are the light of the world. A city is set on a hill. You can't hide a city uh, on a hillside. The light at night, it, it, it screams, I'm here, you know. And he says basically the same thing that Mark uh, is, is telling us that Jesus said in this parable. You can't, you don't light a lamp and put it under a basket. You put it in the center of the room on a lampstand. And he says this in verse 16. He, Jesus says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let Christ be seen in your life. When we let Christ shine through our lives through obedience and sacrifice and service, through living and loving like Jesus, and, you know, the, the, when we do that, the kingdom of God grows. And people understand they need Jesus. And, and so folks, if, if you want to see the kingdom of God ushered in, which if you belong to Jesus, you ought to want to see that. Uh, live and love like Jesus and let Christ be seen in your life. Uh, another action you can take to us here in the kingdom of, of God is this. Not only should we let Christ be seen in our life, but we should share the truth and watch God work. Now I know that's two things. It's compound, but they kind of go together. I hope you can see that here in the next few verses. In verses 26 through 29, Jesus shared another parable about sowing seeds, popular stories at that time, I guess. But it, in the earlier one, the one we looked at last week, remember, Jesus shared about a sower sowing and the rest, receptivity of the soil, right? And uh, we, we talked about how it was basically someone sowing the gospel, sharing the gospel, and the, the receptivity of the soil represents the receptive heart, the different kinds of hearts that people have, whether they will receive the word of God or not. And, and so the emphasis here in this story, in these next few verses, is upon the innate power of the seed. That's the difference. There's a sower, but the emphasis is not on the sower, it's on the seed and what the seed does. And look what Jesus said in verse 26. He says, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter, scatter seed on the ground. And then he goes to sleep at night and he gets up the next day and he doesn't really understand how it happens, but the seed sprouts and it grows. And that's the way most of us are. We don't really know exactly what's happened, but we know if we put a seed in the ground and it gets some water, before long there's supposed to be a sprout come up, right? And then he says, you know, the, first the blade comes up, then the head, and then the full grain, and then you harvest it, and you have your food, and you have your seed for another harvest. But the, the parable points this out. It points out that once the seed is sown, the seed does all the work from there. You know, you sow the seed, then the seed just does its thing, right? That's what happens. And this is, this is the point that Jesus, Jesus is making. The point is that when, is this, when you share the word of God, like a seed, it takes root in people's hearts and in people's lives and around them, and it does its work from there. God does his work from there. You sow the seed, the word of God does the work. And God works through that. And I, I'm a firm believer in this. You, you, you share the word of God, God's going to do something with it. So don't quench the word, the word of God, especially when the Holy Spirit's prompting you to share the word of God. God's got something planned. He's got some... It, this all involves sowing and growing and harvesting. And I want you to notice in this parable, the person sowing the seed is not identified. It, it doesn't matter who's sowing the seed. That, that's not important. Listen to me. God can take the shared word of God from any willing vessel and reap a great harvest. It doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't have to be Billy Graham. It, it, it doesn't have to be 
some, you know, uh, famous preacher or a large church. It can be you. You. Hear the word of God and watch God's word work through the spirit of God. You know, once it's thrown, it, it, it's going to do what it's designed to do. Just like a seed. You throw a seed out, it's got a design purpose of how to reproduce. That's what the word of God does. It, it, he knows what to do with the word. You, you share the word of God and it'll do what the word of God does. You know, and maybe this is what James, you know, the half-brother of Jesus was thinking about in James 1.21 when, when he uh, said this. He said, receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. You see, he understood that when the word of God is implanted in your heart, it can save your soul. Because that's what the word of God does. It convicts and converts and changes hearts and lives. That's what it does. You know, this past week, on Thursday night, there was a baseball game held. Maybe you heard about it. It was held at a place called the Field of Dreams in Dyersville, Iowa. It was a match between the White Sox and the Yankees. And the White Sox wound up winning 9-8, to eight, in case you're interested. But, but the Field of Dreams, most of you may know, was born from a... Actually, it came from a book, I think, called Shoeless Joe, originally. But a movie came out in 1989 called The Field of Dreams, starring Kevin Costner, who in that movie was a farmer... And uh, in the movie, he, this farmer was enticed to build a baseball field in the middle of his cornfield. Some of you all probably have seen this. And he was prompted by a ghostly phrase. What was it? All right, yeah, y'all are misquoting it. That's what I thought. Uh, you know, the real quote in the movie is, if you build it, he will come. That's right. He will come. But everybody, you know, just like the Star Wars misquotes or whatever, it, 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 they say, if you build it, they will come. And, and you know, that, that's what people know. But from there, he did build it. And guess what? They did come, didn't they? But he came. Shoeless Joe Jackson, I believe, is who they're referring to. He came. But not only he, but, but ghosts of baseball pass, right? They came and they played on his field. It, it was a good movie. I, I, I enjoyed it. I don't know. But, it, but, but I want you to understand something important from this today is if you share the word of God, they will come. They will come to Jesus. If you share the word of God, people will come to Jesus. <laughs> you know, God's word does what it does. He accomplishes what he wants. And eventually, if you share the word of God and people come, eventually, guess what happens? He will come. He will come. <laughs> oh, and then we'll be with him forever. Amen? <laughs> That's the message of this parable, the second parable that Jesus told here. But the prophet Isaiah said in uh, Isaiah 55, 11, he says, uh, God says that my word that goes forth out of my mouth, it will not return to me void, but it will accomplish what I please, and it will prosper in whatever I have sent it to do. You see, if you want to see the kingdom of God ushered in, then you take these two actions. You let Christ be seen in your life. Let Christ shine through your life by the way you live. Live like Jesus. But also, share the truth and let God do his work. Share the gospel. Share the word of God. Plant those seeds. Sow the word of God. And the kingdom of God will be built. If you've been around here long enough, you've heard me say it a lot and pray a lot. Build your kingdom, Lord. That's what we want. We want his kingdom to be built. That means we want every person who's going to believe and make up the kingdom of God to come to faith in Christ. Because at that moment, folks, when that happens, it's going to get a lot better. <laughs> it's going to get a lot better. So there's one more action that I want you to understand that you can take this morning to usher in the kingdom of God and, and, and that's this you should expect great things from God when we look at this last parable Jesus shared this last parable has also to do with seeds also a very popular seed stories right uh, uh, but uh, Jesus starts his story out 
this time with a question about the kingdom of God. He says, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God? How can we picture the kingdom of God? He's he's trying to help people understand what the kingdom of God's like. He's he's trying to help us understand the kingdom of God, right? He says, how can I picture this for you? And this is another thing about the kingdom of God that I think is important for us to understand. And he compares the kingdom of God here to a mustard seed. He said, it's like a mustard seed. And the mustard seed's sown in the ground. And he says, it's a small, I wish I had a mustard seed, but but uh, it, 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 some of you have probably seen them. But they're, they're about the, if you sharpen your pencil very fine, it's about the size of the tip of the pencil. You know, it's, it's about that size. Just a small little seed. Uh, maybe, a, maybe a little, obviously it's round, so if you rounded it off, you know, this, this is that size. But, but it's a very small seed. And, and it was the smallest seed known in Palestine, in Jesus' day, in that area. And, and um, it, it seems to have been used quite often to, um, as a sort of a, um, an illustration, I can't think of the word I'm looking for, but to, to relate smallness, you know. And so, uh, you know, you might tell somebody, hey, you're small as a mustard seed, you know. I mean, that, that kind of thing. And as a matter of fact, you probably are familiar with another time when Jesus used a mustard seed to talk about smallness. He said in Matthew 17, he said, because of your unbelief, he says, listen to this, he says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be moved from here to there and it'll move and nothing will be impossible for you. Jesus is saying, hey, if you had faith this big, you know, about the size of your pupil, then no telling what you could do because of that faith. So he's talking about smallness, right? And so here, the point Jesus makes with the mustard seed in this story is that the kingdom of God starts out very, very small. Very small, almost insignificant in the world, it seems. Nobody's really noticing. You know, you have Jesus, and, he, and we've, we've seen some of this going through the Gospel of Mark, and he calls some followers, doesn't he? James and John and Peter and Andrew, and then he gathers a few more, and now he's got 12, and there's these large crowds falling. But, it, but, but what he's getting at is that the, the kingdom of God starts out very small, but then it explodes with growth into something unbelievably large in proportion to its humble beginning. That's the point. And, uh, you know, a mustard seed plant grows uh, between 10 and 12 feet in height very, very quickly. And um, he points out here in his parable that it's big enough and the leaves are large enough and the branches are strong enough that birds can come and nest in those branches. Even though it's not a tree, it's, it's a shrub-like plant. Shrub-like, not really a shrub either, I don't think. But, but anyway, but what's the point? Jesus is describing the awesome growth of the kingdom of God. From a small group of 12 disciples, the kingdom of God, we know, expanded through the ages and grows eventually into the greatest of all kingdoms that we know from Revelation and, and from the prophecies that that eventually will include people from every tribe, every tongue, every people group, every type of people around the world, every nation will be part of this kingdom. And you know what else? This kingdom will never end. That's what happens. It starts out very small and winds up with something out of this world. That's the story Jesus tells. That's the kingdom of God. This is what he's trying to get us to understand. Expect great things from God. Because God's got great things planned. We don't we sell him too short a lot of times. We we think, oh, you know, and we, we think, well, God can't use us for anything great, but God can use anybody for whatever he wants. God is great. He is awesome. And uh God's kingdom is awesome. It's awesome now. But when it's done, it's going to be awesomer. Right? <laughs> oh, man. We, we, you wouldn't even believe. But in the last couple of verses, he says, and with these type of parables, Jesus spoke the word so they were able to hear it. But And, and <laughs> it seems like he's saying they, he always spoke the parables. And it, it was just his style. It's like he, he always was telling these stories and then he, when he was alone with his disciples, he would explain 
these stories to them. And uh, explain them to his disciples. But this goes back to what he said earlier. You know, listen to him. Listen to Jesus. Stay with Jesus. Draw close to Jesus. Listen, if you want to understand the Bible, stay close to Jesus. Spend time with Jesus. Listen to Jesus. And then you'll understand the truth that Jesus wants you to understand. And then you will know him more fully and you'll connect with him more completely and you will experience him and his power and his work in your life more and more. And he will lead you and he, he will help you. That's Jesus. That's what he does. You know, with all the, the COVID-19 illnesses over the last year and a half, we've seen a lot of things canceled. You know, stuff canceled that I never would have in my life ever believed would be canceled. You know, uh, I mean, the college baseball season. Nope, no more, right? Um, limited football and basketball attendance. I mean, concerts canceled. Even a lot of people's work canceled. Plenty of places shut down. We've seen limited seating and social distancing till most of us are sick of it. And, you know, uh, and with this most recent upsurge in illnesses, you know, I mean, I, I know I've been wondering, are we going to see full stadiums and full restaurants this fall and this winter? I mean, that's the world we live in, isn't it? It's questionable. What, what, what's going to happen? You know, what in the world is going on? It's all questionable. But you know what's not questionable? The kingdom of God is not questionable. Nothing is going to stop the kingdom of God. That is a sure thing. The kingdom of God is coming. And I want to tell you this morning, the kingdom of God is near to you. The kingdom of God is near to you. It may be closer to you today than it's ever been before. Maybe you've never entered the kingdom of God. Today there's an opportunity for you to do that. You can do that by believing that Jesus is the Son of God. Believing that He died on the cross to take the penalty for your sins. And that He rose again from, uh, from death. And, and knowing and believing that He loves you and He made this way for you to have eternal life by believing by grace through faith alone that that you can be saved in Him. And if you call out to Him, and if you confess your sin to Him and surrender to Him as your Lord and Savior, you can enter the kingdom of God. That's it. And you can experience the greatness that God has planned for all those who are His. Will you do that today? That's the invitation. Let's bow our heads and let's respond in faith today. Lord, we do bow before you today. Lord, we're thankful for who you are and all that you've done for us. God, we're thankful that you have a plan and Lord, that, that your kingdom is a sure thing. And Lord, we're so grateful that you've made a way for us all to be a part of it. So right now, Lord, I pray that you would save souls and change lives. For your glory, for the building of your kingdom, in Jesus' name.